All right, good evening, Calvary. How are you doing this evening? Praise the Lord. Oh, I love that. Man, that was great worship. Love worshiping Jesus. Take out your Bibles to the book of Zechariah. You know, it's what been so wonderful as we've been going through the minor prophets is just, just saying and looking at all these different books, right, that normally we wouldn't be reading. Uh, these are some of the last books that most people read. Of course, they're at the end of the Old Testament, um, but they do pack a punch and there is a purpose for them. And of course, God has a message for us tonight, as always, every time we open his word. And here we come to the second of the last book in the Old Testament, the book of Zechariah. So let's begin with prayer. Lord, we ask that you would just bless your word. You honor it every single time. You said every time it goes forth, it will accomplish for what you purposed it for. And that's to change lives, to change hearts, to encourage, to exhort. And we pray for all of that to take place by your Holy Spirit tonight as we look at this very fascinating prophet. So bless your word tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. We all say Amen. So here we're coming near the end, as I said, to the minor prophets. And Zechariah is the second of three prophets who wrote after the children of Israel had returned from their Babylonian captivity back to Jerusalem. So Zechariah prophesied around 520 B.C., and he was a contemporary of the prophet Haggai. We saw him last week. Now, if you remember, uh, we saw this in the book of Haggai, that the children of Israel had come back, they had returned to the land, and they had begun now to establish the city and for the very first time now rebuild the temple. The problem is they only got as far as laying the foundation and uh, they experienced opposition from the people around them and they caved into it, they caved into the pressure and they stopped building the temple of God. So both prophets Haggai and Zechariah were called by God to encourage the people to go back and finish the work of building the temple. Now, whereas we saw last time Haggai was more practical, we would definitely say Zechariah is more prophetical. He gives many prophecies in this book concerning Jesus' first and second coming. And then he is given many visions. Many of them we'll even see here tonight as he calls the people to repent and get back to putting God first in their life. So that's kind of a backdrop. So let's jump into chapter one. We read in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, of course, that was the king of Persia. They conquered the Babylonians and they, of course, released the children of Israel to go back into the land after 70 years. And the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechah, the son of Edo, the prophet, saying. So again, I said this is around 520 B.C., Haggai and Zechariah are prophesying really alongside of one another. But Zechariah has a word to say. He says, the Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts. And I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, this reminds me very much of James 4.8. If you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. And here he's telling, repent, you know, return to me and I will return to you. They blew it in the past. Now you've come back and land. Put me first. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not hear nor heed me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? Well, most of them are dead. They died in Babylonian captivity. And the prophets, do they live forever? Of course, the answer is no, and no one does. Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us, according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. Many prophets were sent before telling them to repent, to repent from their idols, and they refused. And then, of course, God took them into captivity. So God is now calling them through the prophet to return to the Lord. Now we read in verse seven, on the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, uh, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Bechariah, the son of Edu, the prophet. So this is three months later from just that quick introduction. And what we have now is a prophecy. 
And Zechariah is, it's a long prophecy, and he's given eight visions, all in one night. I'm going to tell you, that's a lot to digest in one night. It encompasses six chapters. That's a lot for one man to absorb in one evening. But we're going to look at it. So here we have the first vision. It's found in verses 8 through 17. It is the vision of the rider on the red horse. He writes, I saw by night and behold a man riding on a red horse and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow, which would be a ravine. And behind him were horses, red, sorrel, and white. So here we have this man on the horse and three other horses. And Zechariah's response is the same as ours. Then I said, my Lord, what are these? What's this represent? So the angel who talked to me said to me, I will show you what they are. And the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are the ones whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the whole earth. And so most scholars would say, well, these are probably angelic beings that were sent on patrol, perhaps to give a report of the earth. So the Lord answered the angel of the Lord. Now this is different, who stood among the middle trees. So this main writer is called the angel, capital A, and if you've been with us studying a long time, you know whenever you see that in the Old Testament, that is a uh, Old Testament reference to a pre-incarnate visitation of Christ or what we call a Christophany. So here we have Christ, in essence, sending out these angels to give a report on the earth. And they said, we've walked to and fro throughout the earth and behold, the earth is resting quietly. So everything seems to be good. And the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem, on the cities of Judah, against which you were angry these 70 years? So everything seems to be at peace. The people have come back, but uh, we pray that this, this return to the land will be good. They've been wayward. And of course, this is why God sent Haggai and Zechariah to encourage them to put God first. So the Lord answered the angel who talked to me with good and comforting words. The angel who spoke to me said to me, proclaim saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. So God had brought his people back and, and God says, I'm zealous to see the work complete. And, and this is going to be a vision after a vision after vision, encouraging them to do that. Now, he says, I'm zealous for my people, but, verse 15, I'm exceedingly angry with the nations at ease, for I was a little angry, and they helped, but with evil intent. And this is a reference to the Babylonians, whom God used as an instrument to judge his people. However, they intensified their chastening against God's people with evil intent, and God did not look favorably on that. And that's why God brought the Persians, the Medes and the Persians, to take them out. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I'm returning to Jerusalem, though with mercy. My house shall be built. And again, this is what they were being encouraged to do. My house shall be built, and it says the Lord of hosts, and a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Again, proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities again shall spread out through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. So again, they would be established back into the land. Now, we move on and we have a second vision, and this is the vision of four horns and four craftsmen. Now, it's not really the best of pictures. You'll see why I put those up there. Now, here's what Zechariah says. I raised my eyes and looked, and there were four horns. Now, horns in the Bible represent power. The horns of an animal represents its power, whether it's a ram or a bull. And I said to the angel who talked to me, what are these? So he answered and he said, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So this is a reference to those powerful nations that drove you out. Assyria, Egypt, Chaldea, Babylon. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And you're wondering why I didn't put four little craftsmen up there. It's probably what you're wondering from the pic up there. Well, this term was often used to describe those who made weapons. We might call them a smith. And so I said, what are these craftsmen coming to do? And he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head. But the craftsmen, these men that make weapons, um, are coming to terrify them, to cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. So 
these, this is a reference to the nations that God used to actually judge those other nations and to remove them out. So God was faithful to raise up instruments to judge the others that came against his people and establish them. So that's essentially what he's saying. Now let's come to chapter two. And here we have the third vision. Again, this is all in one night. And this is the vision of the measuring line. Then I raised my eyes and I looked and behold a man with a measuring line in his hand. So here you have a picture of an angel. We put that up there with a, a surveyor's line. And what is he surveying? I said, well, where are you going? He said, to measure Jerusalem, to see what it's width and what it's length. Again, they had just returned from Babylon and, and God is wanting them to rebuild the city. And there was an angel who talked to me going out and another angel who was coming out to meet him. And he said to him, run, speak to this young man saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. So again, this is a word of encouragement in this vision from Zechariah to the people. They're gonna return to the land. Now, when they first returned, it was nothing but a bunch of rubble, heaps of rubble. Uh, but they began to clear it out. They began to build cities. They began now to build the temple. And it didn't have walls. It won't be later till Nehemiah comes and they'll build the walls. But God is assuring them the city will be built again. For I, says the Lord, will be a wall of fire all around her and I will be the glory in her midst. So this is God, you know, they'd been devastated, but God is saying, I'm gonna protect you from your enemies. I'm gonna surround you. So I'll surround you like a wall of fire, but even better than that, my glory will be in your midst. This was an encouraging word because if you remember back to the book of Ezekiel, in chapter eight, Ezekiel, this is prior to them going into captivity, God removed his glory first before he destroyed it. And Ezekiel sees the glory rising up from the temple. And then he sees the glory of God moving to the outer court. And then he sees the glory of the Lord going out the east gate and departing. And it was a sign to the people, God is leaving. This is Ichabod, you know. And so now they've come back and land as God is saying, my glory will be there. My glory will return. That was good news. Verse six, up, up, flee from the land of the north, says the Lord, for I have spread you abroad like four winds of heaven, says the Lord. Up, Zion, escape you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. So flee from the north, which is Babylon, come inhabit the land. For thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. So God says, you come in the land, I'll, I'll take care of you because he who touches you is touching me in the eye. Now, the apple of the eye is the ancient way for describing the pupil. Now, there's something about our eyes. When someone even launches towards our eyes, we wince and our eyelid immediately closes. It's a reaction, you know. And, you know, but sometimes we're not always that quick and we can get poked in the eye. And what God is saying is when people touch my kids, it's like poking me in the eye. And I don't like that. That's what God is saying. Isn't that kind of cool? For surely I will shake my hand against them and they shall become spoil for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst. Again, God promising his presence. Now, many believe from this point on, he's even shifting gears, talking to the ultimate reign of Christ in his millennial reign in Jerusalem. Because he does add in verse 11, many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day. Perhaps a, rever a reference to the millennial reign. And they shall become my people and I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And the Lord will take possession of Judah as his inheritance in the holy land. And will again choose Jerusalem. I love that because that's where he will establish his throne when he comes back. We read in Revelation 19, he comes, the nations make war with him. The sword goes out of his mouth. He wipes them all out. And then he goes into Jerusalem and he makes that his, his temple. I love verse 13. Be silent all flesh before the Lord for he is aroused from his holy habitation. Wow. There's coming a day where God is going to arise from his holy habitation and he's coming to earth. I hope it's soon. I hope it's tonight. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, right? 
chapter 3. And here we have Zechariah's fourth vision, an encouraging one. This is the vision of the brand taken from the fire. Verse 1, he showed me Joshua. Joshua, if you remember, was the high priest. Zerubbabel was the governor. Joshua was the high priest. We saw that in the book of Haggai. Now, Joshua, the high priest, is standing by the angel of the Lord. That's by Jesus. So you have Jesus, you have Joshua, and standing opposite of him is Satan. Interesting. What an interesting concept here. Now, there's obviously, this is a picture of accusation. You have the Lord, you have Satan on this side, and, and Joshua, we know he was the high priest at this time, and there's an accusation, and you'll see that as we move through this passage. This is your high priest. This is the guy that's supposed to be holy and represent the people, you know? He's unfit. He's unworthy. He's defiled. Look at verse two. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? So Jesus rebukes Satan here because he wants him to know that you know, Jerusalem is my chosen place and Joshua is my chosen man. Now, I love the fact that he calls him a brand plucked from the fire. Now, a brand is nothing but a charred piece of wood. It's, it's, it's burnt up. It's a lot of ash is what it is. It, it, it's soon to be consumed and has no inerrant value. But that was Joshua. He was taken out of the fire. Now, Joshua, it even adds in verse three, was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. So it means he, he's filthy, he's dirty, he's defiled. And, and even Jesus says he's just a brand plucked from the fire. So humanly speaking, yes, Satan, Joshua is a mess. And of course, that's what Satan's saying. He's not fit to be high priest. His case seems to be airtight. By the way, Satan brings the same accusation to the father about us. Ron's not worthy. Look at the sins he's done. Look at the things he's thought, the actions he's taken. He's not worthy to be in your presence. Throw him out. And we are, we're all defiled by sin. But notice what Jesus says in verse four. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him. Take away the filthy garments from Joshua. And he said to him, see, I have removed your iniquity from you. Isn't that beautiful? That's exactly what Jesus does when we give our life to him. We, he sees us through the cross and he, he removes our sin. He sees us white as snow, praise the Lord. And he says, I will clothe you with rich robes. The Bible says in Isaiah that he, ro he clothes us in robes of righteousness. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban, this is on Joshua's head, and they put the clothes on him and the angel of the Lord stood by. Now this is the garment of the high priest. It's described for us in Exodus chapter 20, very specific, all made out of white. And then you have these other things that are added to it. And then you have this white turban that's put on his head. And then there's a gold plate on top of the turban. And it says, holiness to the Lord. Wow, that's, that, God says, that's my man, that's Joshua. So Jesus rebukes Satan and essentially says, on his own merit, you're right. He doesn't stand a chance, but I've forgiven him. I've cleansed him. I've clothed him. He's holy. And this is exactly what Christ does for us. I am so thankful for that. So thankful that he does that. I can never, ever on my own, even attempt to try to do that. Christ does it just through faith in him, cleansing me, forgiving me, putting on robes of righteousness. Oh, thank you, Jesus, right? Then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua. Now listen, Joshua. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you walk in my ways and if you keep my command, then you shall also judge my house and likewise have charge of my courts. I will give you places to walk among those who stand there. So Joshua, I've cleansed you. Now walk in obedience to me. You will walk my courts. You'll be my high priest but walk in obedience. And the same command is to us. I mean, we give our lives to Jesus. He sets us free. And then he says this, now walk in obedience to me. Now walk in the spirit. Walk in light of my word. That's the command for all of us. Now, in the latter part of this vision, it's really a prophetic message about Jesus's future reign. 
Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are wondrous, they're a sign. For behold, I'm bringing forth my servant, the branch. Look at that, all caps. That's Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 11, 1, it says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of God will rest upon him. Verse 9, For behold, the stone, another messianic term, right? The stone whom the builders have rejected has become and is the chief cornerstone, Psalm 118. That I have laid before Joshua upon the stone seven eyes. Now, this is kind of strange, seven eyes. We've looked at this before in prophecy, especially it's mentioned many times in the book of Revelation. In prophecy, eyes represent knowledge, all seeing. And the number seven, of course, is the number of perfection. So this speaks of the Messiah having perfect knowledge of all things. And behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, verse nine, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. So the idea is this, when Jesus the Messiah comes in perfect knowledge in one day, he will separate the wheat from the tares. He will separate the sheep from the goats and those who have surrendered their life to Christ will enter into his millennial reign. And in that day, verse 10, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. That's a proverbial expression speaking of peace and prosperity. It'll be a thousand years of that with Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, chapter four, and here we have Zechariah's fifth vision. This is the vision of the lampstand. Again, all in one night, there were no chapter divisions when this was written. This is all going on in one evening for Zechariah. Now the angel who talked with me then came back and wakened me as a man who was wakened out of sleep. Again, these visions began back in chapter one and verse nine. I think he got a little exhausted. He just conked out. And now he has to get woken up by the angel. I got another one for you. And he said, well, what do you see? So I said, I'm looking and there's a lampstand of a solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. We got a picture up there. You get an idea what it looks like. So what he's seeing is a, what we would call a temple menorah, a seven branch lampstand with seven bowls at the top or receptacles. And now there was oil in each one of them. But he sees something then out of the ordinary. Verse three, two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. The daily job of the priest was every single day, one of them has to go up to the menorah and fill these little receptacles and clean the wicks and so forth. Had to be done every day because the oil would, you know, would run out. They would use olive oil. So what Zechariah, though, what he's seeing here, essentially in this vision, as you see, is a menorah that is being perpetually fed with oil. It's nonstop. It just continues to flow. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked to me saying, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked to me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Now remember, Zerubbabel was the governor. Joshua was the high priest. These are the two men that are helping run the nation now as they've returned, encouraging the people to build the temple. It was a daunting task. So God says to Zechariah in this vision, this is for Zerubbabel. This is what you need to understand. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Now, oil in the Bible represents the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit illuminates, lights, soothes, comforts. He's called the comforter. He refreshes. And God is telling Zerubbabel, you cannot build the temple nor get the people together to do it in your own strength and ingenuity or might. The only way you can do it is to perpetually walk in the spirit. Now, the connection is quite obvious for us. It's the same for us. We try to do things on our own and it only goes so far. Man, I'm going to do this thing. And we set out, man, and we're just, we're worn out. And there doesn't seem to be much fruit because we're doing it in our own strength. Was it really the Lord in the first place? We have to ask ourselves. But when it really is the Lord 
and we're relying on him. He refreshes us along the way. He soothes us along the way. He comforts us along the way. It's like we're being led by him, driven by him. And it's no problem because it's in his power and in his might. It's not elbow grease that's gonna see us through, but the oil of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't need our brains and he doesn't need our brawn. What he needs is us walking in his spirit. C.H. Spurgeon had a good word on this. He said, O churches, take heed lest you trust in yourselves. Take heed lest you say, we are a respectable body. We are mighty in number. We are a potent people. Take heed lest you begin to glory in your own strength. For when that is done, Ichabod shall be written over your walls and the glory shall depart from you. Man, we don't want to trust in our own strength. It's one of the dangers of a church is to trust in their own man-made mechanisms. And we'll, you know, people label themselves, well, we're a seeker church or we're a purpose-driven church or we're a media life church. We have this particular temple, uh, template or pattern and this is what we do and we begin to trust in that pattern. No, what we need to be is driven, directed, endued and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We wanna be a Holy Spirit church, amen? <laughs> amen. So Zechariah continues, who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. So completing this project of doing the temple seems mountainous, but if you trust in my strength, it'll be just like a plain, no problem. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. Again, the foundation had been laid years earlier. And his hands, this is encouraging, shall also finish it. You guys are gonna finish the work. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. That's a good word from the prophet. Then he says in verse 10, for who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. So look at the plumb line's been laid. It's going to be done. But there were many, listen, when the temple was first laid, the foundation, most people were like discouraged. It's never going to be like it was in Solomon's day. It was such a great temple and they despised it and they stopped working on it. But I love this. He says, for who has to despise the day of small things? We don't ever want to do anything like that. It's sometimes easy to do that. It's easy to look at small things or things that we think are insignificant, you know, because in our fallenness, we, we tend to look at bigger is better, right? I mean, a TV is nice, but a jumbotron, well, that's better, right? A three-bedroom house is nice, but an estate, that's better, you know. We often think the same way when it comes to spiritual things. A bigger church, a bigger crowd, a bigger blessing, not always the case. Don't despise the day of small things. You want to be thankful wherever we're at, at any given time in our walks. Because God does great things through small things. I wrote down a few. God used Shamgar's goad. He used David's sling. He used Aaron's rod, Samson's jawbone, Rahab's string, and Mary's ointment. Some small and significant things that God used in a mighty way. We don't want to despise small things. Now, moving on, Zechariah the prophet asked for clarification. He says, then I answered and said to him, what are these two olive trees, though, at the right of the lampstand and to its left? Those are the Holy Spirit, but what are these two trees that were feeding the whole thing? And I further answered and said to him, what are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? Then he answered me, he said, do you not know what they are? I said, no, Lord, I don't. He says, these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord and the whole earth. And he's referring to Zerubbabel and Joshua. These are the two men that I've established to be pillars in your community, to encourage you to do the work. But they will only be able to do it as they themselves, as all of us, trust in the Holy Spirit. Now, chapter five, and we have the sixth vision. This is the vision of the flying scroll. Then I turned and raised my eyes and saw there a flying scroll. Now, of course, the scriptures were not written in books. They were in scrolls. 
He said, what do you see? I said, a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits and its width 10 cubits. Now, a cubit is the measurement between your elbow and your middle finger, usually around 18 inches. So this is a giant scroll. This is like 30 foot by 15 feet flying in the sky. Pretty strange sight, right? So he said to me, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. Every thief shall be expelled according to this side of the scroll and every perjurer shall be expelled according to the other side of it. This is God's word judging the world. I will send out the curse, says the Lord of hosts. It shall enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. It shall remain in the midst of the house and consume it with its timber and its stone. So those who build their house on sand, they'll be judged by God's word. Only those who build their house on the foundation of Christ, the rock. So a very brief vision describing how God uses his word to judge. And of course, that'll be the case at the end of the age as well. Um, moving on, we have a seventh vision. This is the vision of the basket. Then the angel who talked to me came out and said to me, lift your eyes now and see what this is that goes forth. So I asked, what is it? And he said, it is a basket that is going forth. He also said, this is their resemblance throughout the earth. Here is a lead disc lifted up. And this is a woman sitting inside of the basket. So he opens up this lid and there's a woman inside of it. And he said, this is wickedness. And he thrust her down into the basket and then threw the lid over its mouth. So Zechariah sees a basket full of wickedness. It's not allowed to escape, thrown back into the basket, sealed. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there was two women coming in the wind in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. So these are two angelic beings. And they lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. So they lifted it up into the sky. So I said to the angel who talked to me, where are you carrying the basket? And he said, to build a house for it in the land of Shinar. That's the ancient land of Babylon. When it is ready, the basket will be set there on its base. So what, I've, what we have here in this vision is God's reminding, I'm bringing you back into the land to establish the temple. My presence will be there, my glory. It'll be wonderful. And I'm sending wickedness back to Babylon and they will have to deal with it. And then we have chapter six, an eighth and final vision, the vision of four chariots. Then I turned and raised my eyes and looked and behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains and the mountains were mountains of bronze. Now, when we read bronze anywhere in the Old Testament it represents really judgment. All the furnishings on the inside of the tabernacle made of gold and worship to God. All those on the outside dealing with sin, the altar and so forth, the labor, all made of bronze. So Zechariah sees these four chariots coming in judgment. With the first chariot, it was red, there were red horses. With the second chariot, black horses. With the third chariot, white horses. And with the fourth chariot, dappled horses, strong steeds. Now, interesting enough, you can compare this to Revelation chapter 6, and you have these there as well. We call them the four horses or the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Red representing the blood of war, black representing famine, white representing a false security, and dappled or pale representing death. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked to me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said, these are four spirits of heaven who go out from their station before the Lord to all of the earth. This, these are angelic beings sent out to dispense judgment. The one with black horses is going to the north country, the white going after them. The dappled are going towards the south country. Then the strong steeds went out eager to go that they might walk to and fro throughout the earth. And he said, go walk to and fro throughout the whole earth. So they walked to and fro throughout the earth. So dispensing judgment as God asked them. And then he called to me, verse eight, and spoke to me saying, see, those who go towards the north country have given rest to my spirit in the north country. In other words, I am now satisfied they have done their duty. But again, this is a simple vision describing the judgment that God would bring on those who came against his people as he was bringing them back into the land. 
Now, in the remainder of this chapter, we have the crowning of Joshua, the high priest, but it's an unusual crowning. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, receive the gift from the captives from Hadai, Tobijah, Jedidiah, who've come from Babylon and go the same day and enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. So now these are some of the captives that are still returning from Babylon. They've brought back some of the articles from the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had taken, no doubt. So this new group of captives returning with gifts. And God says in verse 11, take the silver and gold that they've brought and make an elaborate crown and set it on the head of Josiah, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Now, this is strange request because um, there was really no crown placed on the high priest's head. He had a, a plaque, holiness to the Lord, but nothing like a kingly crown, which we have here. But God was doing so in prophecy. Because Joshua would be prophetically a priest, a high priest, and a king. In reference, of course, to Jesus Christ. Jesus, of course, his name, we call him Jesus, but his Hebrew name is Joshua, Yahshua, which means salvation. And so he says in verse 12, then speak to him saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold the man whose name is Branch, again, messianic title for Jesus, From his place, he shall branch out. He shall reach to the entire world and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It'll be built right back on the temple mount. It'll be his place of millennial reign. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and he shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall uh, be between them both. So Jesus will establish his throne on the temple mount. His glory will radiate, but he will be both a priest and king to his people. And so Zechariah says, now the elaborate crown then shall be for a memorial. It wasn't something he was really gonna, it was for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. So you put this in the temple that you're now building for these men that he mentions here. So it was essentially a memorial pointing to the Messiah who would one day be both the high priest and king. Even those afar shall come and build the temple of the Lord. Then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord, your God. Now we're going to look at one more chapter. We can do it. Now in the fourth year of King Darius... So this is now 518 BC, about two years after that long night of prophecies. It came to pass that the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month of Chislev. When the people sent Shezariah and Regimelech and his men to the house of God to pray before the Lord. To ask the priests who were in the house of the Lord of hosts. And the prophet saying, should I weep in the fifth month and fast as I have done for many years? So now you have some more men that have returned from Babylon. They've come here and they come and they ask the priests that are there in the temple, not not the high priest, just some of the priests there. Hey, should we should we weep and fast like we've done before in Babylon in the fifth and the and the uh, the seventh month? Should we do that? Now, what's kind of interesting is there's only one fast that God requires of his people. It's only once a year. It's found in Leviticus chapter 16. It's the day of atonement. That was the one day they were called to, uh, to fast. But what had happened is in their captivity, they had established a, a tradition of mourning and fasting at certain times on particular days, on particular months. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, say to all the people of the land and to the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months during those 70 years, did you really fast for me? For me? When you eat and when you drink, do not eat and drink for yourselves. So God knows something about it. It's almost like they were, they were kind of going through some spiritual gymnastics out there to let God know, hey, we just want you to know that we're, we're doing pretty good. God didn't order that. He didn't ask for that. So he says, I don't think your heart was right in that. Should you have not obeyed the words of the Lord proclaimed through the former prophets when Jerusalem and the cities around you were inhabited and prosperous and the south and the lowland were inhabited? How about this? Maybe you should have obeyed me before you were driven to captivity because of your sin. That's what he's saying. 
This is very similar to what Samuel told King Saul. King Saul was not a spiritual man at all. Now, he being the king of the Jews, you know, he, he, he was all for, hey, having sacrifices and so forth. But he just went through the motions. So Samuel comes to Saul and he says in 1 Samuel 15, 22, Saul has the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey him is better than your sacrifice. You're just going through the motion, man. And this is what these people were doing. They say, hey, should we continue to do what we're doing? He says, really, did you really do it for me? And this is a good reminder for us that God is not interested in our rituals and our traditions as much as he is in our obedience to following him, right? Because that's the harder part, isn't it? It's easy to put a show on the outside and do this thing. Well, I said my prayers and I did my whatever. And I, and, but it's harder and it's more challenging to actually live for Jesus and actually spend time with him and follow him and walk in obedience. So verse eight, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, execute true justice, show mercy and compassion, everyone to his brother. Here's what I'm looking for. Show mercy and compassion, everyone to his brother. In other words, fulfill the law of love. That's so practical, isn't it? That's so practical. Don't oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. But they refused to heed, shrug their shoulders and stop their ears so that they could not hear. He's reminding them, this is the way you were before when you went into captivity. I've told you that before and the people refuse. They made their hearts like flint, refusing to hear the law and the words the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Many prophets were sent to you in the past. Thus great wrath came from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it happened that just as he proclaimed and they would not hear, so they called out and I would not listen, says the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations which they had not known. Thus the land became desolate after them so that no one passed through or returned for they made the pleasant land desolate. So God quickly reminds them of a history. Listen. You went into captivity because you were disobedient, not doing the right thing. So what I want you to do is do the right thing. And he really sums it up this way. Love God and love your neighbor. Jesus said that in Matthew twenty-two thirty-six. 36. A religious leader came to, a religious guy comes up to Jesus and he says, hey, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and with all your mind. That's the first commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two, hang all the law. Now, let me make it even simpler. What's the common denominator of those two things Jesus said? Love God and love your neighbor. Love. And so Romans 13, 10 says this, love is the fulfillment of the law, period. Not ritual, not pseudo spiritual hypocrisy, but genuine love that puts God first. And because I do that, I love others. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray.